Uh, before I actually get into something, I want to want to point you to uh, a website that the Local Government Project Office has put together. It is awesome. They have done a totally awesome job of taking an incredibly complex body of stuff of which the environmental is relatively simple and they have made a, a, a toolkit that, that if you don't go there, you are cheating yourself. Okay, I want to sort of introduce this by, say, by answering the question, okay, what does uh, NEPA assignment mean for local governments? Con contrary to something that Sue was saying, I actually think it doesn't mean very much. Why? Because it changed almost nothing for the people who actually produce environmental work. All the laws are the same, all the regulators are the same, everything's the same except for who gets to sign. Okay, so that's the only difference except for the fact that it also introduces the audits that Sue told about. These audits are performed by FHWA in order to determine not whether we're following practices that the FHWA Texas Division used to follow, but to determine whether or not we're following the practices uh, that FHWA Washington policy follows. And I will tell you that FHWA in Washington commonly believed that FHWA in Texas was pushing things a little too far, so we have to be very careful about how we how we order what we do what we need to do under under NEPA assignment is to make sure as much as possible that we are following procedure as closely as possible because on a local government procedure on a local government project excuse me okay we have a local government that is that is taking care of business and we have FHWA holding us responsible at TechStop for how well they did it so I'm going to start off by talking about a few basic terms. The reason being is that we have some basic terms that are legal definitions and uh, uh, that um, um, can create what I'm later going to refer to as some awkward situations. And then uh, we'll follow that up by, uh, by having Mike uh, give you a district perspective on, on the communication issue that, that, that Mike Chavez was talking about. You're all familiar by now probably with the notion of a sponsor. I want to emphasize that a sponsor is an entity who is legally responsible for producing all the environmental deliverables and performing all the various environmental tasks, preparing everything that's going to be necessary for uh, a department delegate to approve a project. The department delegate is the entity who is legally accountable for making a compliant decision. If you as a sponsor make a mistake and the delegate does not catch it, it's not your fault as the sponsor, it's their fault as a delegate. They have approved something that was not, uh, that, that, uh, was not able to actually be approved at that moment. And it's not just approval of environmental documents or categorical exclusions, it is approval of everything in the project file, everything in the project file. Whether that person actually physically reviews it him or herself or not, there was, they are the approval authority for it uh, on record. And then project scope, we just uh, uh, had um, uh, Mike uh, run through scoping. Want to emphasize that this uh, is a way that we establish uh, mutual understanding early in the process. It was, it was developed in response to local government complaints about uh, moving targets. The project scope is a deal between the delegate and the sponsor that establishes the terms of production that everyone's going to meet. It's especially a good opportunity for subject matters that are kind of uh, wishy-washy for you to establish expectations about content so that everybody's working toward a, a, a common goal. Uh, and you're also by now probably aware that the local government project office, uh, as a matter of policy, has established the, uh, uh, the, the district as the single point of contact between the local government and, uh, and the rest of, of TxDOT on local government projects. All right, these things lead to what I'm going to call awkward situation number one. Awkward situation number one occurs when local government is not officially designated by, the, the, uh, by TxDOT uh, as a project sponsor. Um, this would be a case in which a local government, uh, for one reason or another, has decided that it doesn't want to, to assume that role. Interestingly, they'd still do all the same work they would have done if they had assumed the role, but, but sometimes they just don't want to. Right? What this does is that it means that we now have a project scope in which TxDOT is the sponsor, and TxDOT is the legally responsible person for producing and yet they will not produce anything on this project because it all belongs to the local government. 
So how does that get awkward? Well, it gets awkward because it's, if the, we don't have a mutual understanding between the local government and the, and the delegate, then uh, guess who gets caught in the middle when the local government and the delegate have a disagreement about something? It is that sponsor, the district, who had nothing to do with production of the environmental material. So this awkward, this awkward circumstance can be solved or prevented or at least mitigated by having early and ongoing communication. Awkward situation number two arises when the local government sponsor is designated as a sponsor and we have an environmental assessment or an environmental impact uh, statement to uh, deal with. For EAs and EISs, uh, Environmental Affairs Division is the department delegate, but we have the district as the single point of contact uh, we have now institutionalized a handoff um, between the district and uh, um, uh, environmental affairs, uh, putting the district in between the local government and environmental affairs. If the person at the district happens to go on vacation or get sick, okay, then we will have a built-in delay. Uh, whenever we have to have a communication between the, the uh, uh, environmental affairs and, say, the, uh, the sponsors, uh, consultants or something we have to go through a, a district so we have a lot of barriers to, e to efficient communication including the physical handoff of, of materials again one of the things that we can do with this is that we can we can uh, establish a communication protocol and we can build it into the project scope one of the reasons I think it should be built into the scope is that turnover happens and uh, unwritten understandings have a tendency to disappear Whoops. All right. Awkward situation number three occurs regardless of whether the local government is um, uh, designated as the sponsor. Um, the act of producing all this environmental stuff is the act of creating a project file. The project file is the thing that the department delegate is approving when he or she actually uh, issues an approval. And yet there it is sitting in the hands of the, of the local government uh, uh, pretty much out of reach of the department delegate. Uh, we have had an interesting uh, uh, piece of input from Federal Highways in an audit debrief last week. Uh, one of the things that they tagged us for was we had made, we had uploaded stuff into the file after we had made a decision. They thought, well, no, um, because you did not have the project file complete, then you did not have the basis for a decision. This is going to be awkward. What it means is, is that when a local government turns in something for us to approve, uh, they are going to need to turn into us all the elements of the project file upon which that uh, decision will depend. Um, they do not do that now. And uh, so one of the things to make sure that you do is to establish uh, with them some way of transmitting materials to you my recommendation is that they should transmit them to you as soon as they're done because that way you can catch any errors before they turn in the uh, the final product uh, when all the time and the money are gone and with that i'm going to turn you over to mike graham thank you lane uh and Carlos, I graduated in 1977. I, I was feeling pretty good, so I didn't bring my walker uh, today and all. So anyway, uh, I, I'm going to speak a little more informally just what the Laredo District does to help with uh, moving local government projects along. I'm going to speak first to the, the uh, district staff. Uh, first off, how many folks in the districts are here that work with local government projects, on, especially if it's with the environmental? Is there anybody in the audience here? Okay, we got a few. Is there anybody here that is the designated local government's projects manager for the district? Is there anybody here? Okay, so we got one here yesterday. Uh, we, we saw yesterday in the, uh, the awards presentation that the, the person that handles that for the FAR district uh, won, a, won an award. She's very busy and, and really deserved that, that award. Uh, so anyway, Lane has is, is alluded to it that the uh, local government's projects office has a really good training. It's required uh, for the local government project manager and our folks to take. 
if the environmental folks don't understand that process, they're they're going to be behind. That 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 like Lane says, that was a very good process that they have revamped and, uh, just recently, and, and y'all need to understand it. That district local government projects manager is very important on how the environmental uh, process gets handled with these local government projects. Anything that the environmental staff can do in the district to take part of that load off of that, that person would be greatly appreciated. Uh, they, they, they definitely have their hands full handling the engineering side of it and just those day-to-day uh, managerial uh, aspects of those projects. Same thing, district folks, environmental folks that are handling that project, uh, that are managing the environmental for that project, need to know who the local government project manager is as well for the same reasons. Uh, DC ought to be assigning those environmental staff as early on as possible. Uh, the EC should be working during the advanced funding agreement phase of that project as well to make sure that is the scope, is the project sponsor, excuse me, going to be the, the local government, is it going to be the district, are there enough funds assigned in the AFA to do the appropriate amount of environmental reviews. Uh, those kind of aspects need to be looked at very early in the AFA stage is where that's all determined. The scope development tool, and then that leads into the actual uh, written scope that the district and the, uh, or the project uh, delegate, which could be the district, could be ENV, will uh, come up to that, come into that agreement with the local government. Both of those tools are very important. Uh, we, we talked about the, the, uh, that scope development tool uh, with Mike and then Lane referred to it. There's enough desktop tools to answer your question earlier there to where once you get the location, you get the basic, what the project is gonna consist of, is it an expressway, is it new location roadway? There's enough desktop tools out there right now where that can be, uh, that can feed right into that scope development tool very easily. The, uh, like I say, the, the desktop tools are very important. And then what we do in the Laredo District is we, on the local governments, is we encourage them to use technical reports. Just uh, uh, Lane uh, alluded to this earlier. If you've got an archaeologist uh, out there and they're going to develop a report, have that done separately than the biological report or the Waters of the U.S. report. That way on these technical reports you can get them pre-cleared, so to speak. They can be reviewed for are they sufficient, is more work done, need to be done, those kind of things. And so you're not backloading that whole process if you just turn in a, an environmental assessment document. Uh, so we, we've strongly encouraged the use of technical reports in our district. And the district staff, whoever that EC assigns to that, needs to treat that local government project as if it was one of our own. The, now the reason I point this out is, is if the, the environmental staff is lackadaisical, the local government project manager notices that, and the local officials also notice that. There's a real intricate dance that goes on between the district engineers and the local government uh, officials. They're always pushing to get that project done as quick as you can. We need to do it. We want to see it done. Why aren't we doing it? All of those kind of things. That's where the, the district staff can really uh, appear to, to make the district shine and, and where that project can move forward. I'm going to give a couple of quick uh, uh, examples of projects. Uh, both of them are being Laredo. A few years ago, we, we extended the, the loop that goes around the north and east side of town an additional seven miles. Uh, it was new location roadway. And uh, the this district did a lot of work uh, on finalizing the, uh, the environmental assessment for that project. We were very, very familiar with that, with that project there. 
The problem was that the, the city street arterials that would connect to that roadway were lacking. So yes, we had neighborhoods in that area, but they really didn't have an efficient way to get onto the loop. The city of Laredo had some federal funds they were gonna use for that project. Uh, there was three arterial street connections uh, between the three of them, it's about a little over a mile of new location roadway and about 18 acres of additional right of way. Uh, it was determined that an environmental assessment was going to be uh, needed and it would be using federal funds, not local. The, the city of Laredo remained as the project, official project sponsor on that. Because the district had a lot of experience in that area that was just recent, uh, just within the last year uh, before that project kicked off, uh, the, the, we worked out, the district worked out with the city of Laredo in the AFA part of the project there that the district staff would act as the city's environmental consultant. And uh, because of that, there was a, a large time savings because we knew what needed to be in the, uh, in the EA. We knew what the information was required. Uh, and so we moved forward. It took us about nine months to complete from project scoping to FONSI. And the, this was uh, sent to FHWA. It wasn't signed off on uh, at the ENV level on there. We got that done in about nine months uh, there. The other side of it was, was the, the construction funds were very, very limited for this project. Because the district staff knew how to do all this, we could do it much qu more quickly. Uh, it saved uh, the city of Laredo a lot of money. It, it, uh, I know the, the consultants out in the audience hate to hear this, but it cost about a fourth of what it would have been uh, for the city to have gone out and hired an environmental consultant to do that work. Another project in Laredo, it's a little more straightforward, a little more conventional. Uh, there's uh, FM 1472 in the northwest side of Laredo is where all the warehouses uh, are that serve the international bridges. Uh, of course, uh, Laredo is the number two port of entry in the United States. There's uh, Port of New York, there's Laredo, and there's everybody else. Uh, this city street was, feeds into 1472 out of the commercial warehouse districts and some of the support businesses over there. Uh, the, the intersection was misaligned. The idea is to get that to where we could reduce the signal lights from two to one. Uh, and so that was the nature of that uh, project. The city is the, uh, is the project sponsored. This project had been around for a few years, and so they already had a, an environmental consultant on board. Uh, once the city decided what they actually wanted to build, uh, most of the environmental studies had been completed and just needed a minor refreshing uh, to move forward. They actually had a categorical exclusion document when we informed them that we needed to see technical reports because we no longer had CE documents that what we worked out with the city was, was we would just rename that document because it was sufficient. It had all the information needed to support the categorical exclusion finding. And so we just changed the name of that uh, project, refreshed what information we needed to refresh and moved on. We did have a little bit of trouble getting the city uh, project manager to actually sign the project scope. Once we explained to them that they didn't have an objection to the scope there. That was all fine with them. It was just getting the signature on the piece of paper. When we, in a, we went to a project meeting, explained to them that that project is basically stalled until that project scope is signed off on and approved by both parties. So at the meeting, the, the, uh, the pro local government project manager signed it. I was the department delegate. I signed it right there. We made copies and we moved forward. Uh, we cl uh, cleared that project as a C23 because the, the total federal funds was well below the $5 million limit. And it took us about six months uh, to finish up some coordination and then, and then the environmental document uh, or the, the CE was approved. And so right now it's in, in right of way acquisition and they are gonna, uh, they're in core uh, coordination right now. I, I'm just going to wrap up by just uh, pointing out a few things to both the local governments and the district staff. Again, 
that local government projects manager is over typically overloaded anything that the environmental staff can do to help that person out will be greatly appreciated the LG staff we're from the government and we are actually there to help you and we really mean it in the Laredo districts we want to do everything we can to make that make sure that project moves forward in a timely manner we don't want a project languishing because it's something on our part if the local government has issues or, or whatever on getting something finished we'll do whatever we can to help get that moved over patience is a virtue when you're dealing with local governments i'm sure you know this very well uh, i know anybody who works with them they don't understand our process that well, so uh, the district, our district has to do a lot of hand-holding uh, to, to uh, make sure that that project moves forward. Again, the district environmental staff that's assigned to that project better be proactive in, in helping that, that project move forward. Uh, being in communication with the, 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 the local government uh, coordinator, our projects coordinator, and the local government there to make sure that the reports that are due are, are, are coming in on time, those kind of things. The, the environmental folks need to be going to these meetings. If it's just strictly an invoicing meeting, things, something like that, okay. But if the engineering is gonna be discussed in that meeting there, even if you don't have an environmental issue per se that you're gonna discuss there, I, don't, I can't tell you how many times I've gone into these meetings and all of a sudden the local government engineers, their consultants start saying, well, we, we, we think we need an easement over here or this creek cleaning needs to be extended and, and all of those kind of things. That sends off those triggers for the district environmental staff to say, do you know what you're actually, uh, what this is, could lead to uh, if you really want to move forward with that? So. It's at a certain point, okay, at a certain point there, the district officially asks the local government, can we talk directly to your technical experts? Can we talk to your design engineer? Uh, those kind of things. If, there, if there's an archeological issue in some report, our archeologist that's reviewing the project should be able to talk to the, the, consult, the, 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 the local government's archeologist that's doing that, let them resolve that issue, keep everybody in the loop, and then you just move forward. The, the EC has to make sure that there's uh, uh, enough time figured into the, the work schedules on that. And at a certain point, our district has found that if, there, if we get down to that very last minor revisions at the very end of a project with the permission of the local government and uh, just allow us to change that one sentence add this small phrase here or there and then we can just push that across the the goal line uh, instead of doing that whole circle where we send that information to the local government they send it to their consultant it comes back in reverse if it's something very minor we just ask permission to just change that keep everybody in the loop and, and finish up there. Again, the, the, the environmental staff in our district needs to be proactive and a champion for their project because again, like I say, the local government officials are watching our performance on how we uh, treat the local government uh, project managers, things like that. Are we perceived, that the last thing we want is to be perceived as being the roadblock on moving a project forward. And we always try and move this, the, the environmental clearance to be ahead of schedule, just one on what uh, Sue and, and, and the others have referred to, that any kind of extra time that you can give the right-of-way folks, the utility folks, and even the local government officials to say, we push this project ahead of schedule, not behind schedule, is very important. 